and we are back. We've hoped you've missed us. It's been what two weeks since our last uh, hurrah on it's here. Been, it's been a while, hasn't it? Yeah, it's been far too long. We weren't here for Raisin. I'm sure you all know why. Uh, well, I mean, we don't for some explain. people, we could not possibly explain. That's true. But. So if you don't know, you don't know. It's an if you know, you know type thing. Uh, but today, we are very excited for this show because we get to welcome Harrison. Harrison, you want to say hi? Hey, everybody. Harrison. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is my friend Harrison. Um, Harrison and I actually became friends because of history as a class. It's true. Um, yeah, my friend Paige, if she's listening, uh, and I met him first year, first week of class at a party, and he told us he took history, and we told him that he was now going to sit with us for I every history class. I do not remember class. that conversation, but right. it did happen. But he, but he did sit with us for the next two years. Yeah. Um, Wait, so. which class was this? Which module? This was like the basic this history one. Yeah, yeah, 107. Remember yeah. that one? Oh, early modern. Yeah, yeah. like that we met him and we were like, so what do you take? And he's like, history. And we're like, oh, you're now our CD. Those were the lectures when the lights were dimmed. <laughs> yeah, and they only talked about the printing press and the oh reformation for it. Everyone was kind of talked in a, in a muffled voice. Yeah. <laughs> we learned about Fingley. Oh my God, Fingley. <laughs> Literally, I was. Uh, this, is a, this is a weird thing. It'll probably come up a couple times today. Um, okay. I was at drinks <laughs> last night with two kids in my MO. 1008 uh, history class and That's my nice. tutor from that class <laughs> last night at Bruco. Uh, Sarah <laughs> Faye. The up there today, and, on the booze. <laughs> on a Saturday uh, <laughs> night. And we, no, we, we talked a lot about um, those those modules. Oh, that's and what he thought chat. of them. <laughs> Could they be repeated on radio? or? Uh, let's just say he has some thoughts about the Reformation and Uh-oh. its occurrence in those courses. Don't Uh-oh. We all. Uh-oh. Some might Uh-oh. say he might it was one too many times. It's almost like that class needs to be reformed. Oh, snap. <laughs> Bang. Ooh, thank you. Oh, no. <laughs> That's why I'm here. <laughs> if you didn't know, uh, Harrison also does stand-up. He does. You should definitely go. He's going on Tuesday. 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 Yeah. That's right. Going Tuesday. I Come on that. down. Sandy's Bar. It's going to be lit. I, I didn't realize this has become our new promo show. Of just... So we just... No, and I will be in costume. So that's... <laughs> Oh, my God. I did not know that. I'll be a minion. I'll be in a minion onesie. Oh, no. Yeah, we have the Concrete off, Catwalk uh, party that night, and I scheduled my, my appearance and my camera thing so that I could watch your stand-up. Well, yes. you're not going to go in masquerade again. <laughs> no, we have to, so I will be at your stand-up in black You're tie. going in masquerade. I have to. It's the theme. I'm required to go. I'm on committee. That's just how it be. Okay. Mm. Should we get into what happened this week? We probably should. Yeah. Oh, let's talk about it. So, so Shores, you want to go first? Well, I I came across this on the train down, and oh my, this is one of my favorite episodes of World War II. And so we big, all have them, you know. Big, big boy ben, Benito Mussolini. Oh my god! He's just seen the fall of France. He's just seen the conquest of the Low Countries, Denmark, Norway, and he thinks, "Tell you what, how how hard can that be?" He's already got Albania. He's already done a bit of fighting in uh, Libya and uh, in Somaliland. So he thinks, "Oh, Greece." You know, I'll just I'll just have a bit of that. That should be fine. You know, invade a sovereign nation, just outright. And uh, needless to say, it goes absolutely terribly. <laughs> Greece actually invades Albania. That's right. <laughs> They're so bad, um, the Italian forces in the invasion that it takes Hitler having to invade Yugoslavia to get Dream. to Greece to actually help out uh, Mussolini. Was so Hitler amused by that? Some would uh, he, say did, no. he really did not like that at all. <laughs> Some would say no. It actually no. led to the uh, the paratrooper invasion of Crete, which is the first time in oh, history. Love Crete, paratroopers. <laughs> sort of the paratroopers. Yeah, sure. paratroopers. Yeah. <laughs> love Crete. Which led to a very dramatic episode with uh, Brits trying to get off the island. Mm. Um, so that that happened this week. Very interesting. Very yikes. interesting episode of World War Two that's often forgotten about. All right. Um, in 1904, this week, the New York City subway first opened. Now, if we have any New Yorkers out there, we all know that was a historic moment for the world, <laughs> and most definitely for New York, and probably for the giant rats that now live down there. Yeah, and the weirdos. Um, <laughs> I'm from New York, so that's it's good. Uh, also, in this week, uh, Pablo Picasso was born, which I think is funny because for a guy who gets mentioned as much as he does, he is not really relevant to any of our lives. <laughs> So, Ooh, wow, I think we're going to put that straight in the claim pile. And, uh, <laughs> and this... I, I mean, I'm not an art history guy, but don't at me. So. No. Yeah, art history is their own little thing, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, man. We don't really talk about them. No. no. Get, rid of, get, get to... rid of the dang thing. Sorry. <laughs> so, anyway, um, so the way that Harrison, myself, and Sarah kind of spent a lot of last semester was uh, studying for the <laughs> HI 2001 course in which there was a bit of a debate oh, much of the time 
But you, also, apparently, you either love that chorus or you hate it. I think all three of us well, would, we all hate would fall in the hate category, but sadly. But one thing that uh, Harrison would often bring up when we were discussing <laughs> historians uh, would be um, historians, just generally. Yeah, um, so this week's theme is, does history need historians? And that's a, that's a big question, I think. I came up with it last night after drinks with my <laughs> history tutor yeah, and, uh, and Joey episode. and Tom, <laughs> if they're listening. Uh, <laughs> and it was because uh, my tutor was sort of discussing how he wasn't fond of how history was going or the direction that history was going as a discipline. So we were like, that's a bit of a claim um, as, our, as our tutor from first year. Why? Um, he was like, well... For his PhD, which he just finished, he's now a doctor. Mm. Uh, he had the, the the concept of a PhD is you're an expert in the topic because you've read everything at all about the topic um, by every historian. And apparently, when he was when he was getting uh, spoken to about his PhD, they were like, "Oh, but you didn't mention this one historian." And he was like, "Yes, okay, fine, but I mentioned like 37 others, and I didn't agree with that historian. So why would I mention him? I mentioned other ones I disagreed with." And they were like, "Well, you've got to mention them all." And so he was talking about that, and that really reminded me of historiography last semester because the entire concept was like, you have to study all these historians, and you have to be able to quote what they said, and that's how your essay is valid. And I think that that's, uh, that's an interesting concept that we are being taught, that our opinion as a historian, because I looked up the definition of historian, and all it is is an expert in or a student of history, mm -hmm. especially that of a particular period, geographical region, or social phenomenon. So technically, because we're all students of history, we are historians. Bang. And so why is it that we have to quote X amount of historians in a paper, like a scholastic paper, in order for it to be listened to? I mean, it's kind of like saying, though, uh, since we are all observant and we can all, you know, we're all f thoughtful, we're all still scientists, so why do we need to quote scientists or refer to scientific work? And it's because they're experts in their field, isn't it? No, but I think the difference with that is, and, and again, I'll go back to the example that my history professor gave, that he had like, like 27 or whatever, 37 historians that he quoted, but because he didn't quote one other one, his work was not as valid. Do you think it's kind of funny you're mentioning his, a historian and you're arguing about historians? Yeah, true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Accurate. Um, but I don't know. I thought that was a really interesting concept that he was he was just like discussing sort of why why is a historian's opinion needed to justify our own? I'll get my I'll get my little opinion in here because it's going to come out a lot during this episode anyway. <laughs> All right, Harrison has this some is, opinions this about is, this. This is what we're talking about. <laughs> All historians are hacks. <laughs> All, there it they, is. They, oh, there yes. it is. They're all biased and they all lie in some way or another. Not 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 always meaning to. I'll give them that. But sometimes they do mean to and they just sometimes it be Snaky. like that. And they sometimes do. it really be like that. And that's 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 kinda where I landed on the whole historiography. <laughs> At the end I of the scale, just we, none of them. We we designed this show um knowing Harrison was gonna guest star I'm and we chose upset. to do historical hacks <laughs> because Harrison and I studied a bunch for the exam last semester and a lot of it was just rants about historical hacks. Yeah, my I can, actually, I can't even remember what I wrote my essay on. That's how hacky it was. <laughs> <laughs> just quoting a bunch of, like, historians. Exactly. That were really irritating. Even, I'll, I'll even admit I'm even a hack to some extent, but I don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't base my whole reputation on me not being a hack, and that's the key difference between me and them. Integrity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, to understand, I guess, why we need historians, I guess... I mean, I'm not saying we don't need historians. That's obviously not my point. Uh, my point is that... I mean, it's I mean, it's okay. It's like, in a way, it is <laughs> if you were to interpret it like that. My point is that. My point is, in an essay, if I'm writing an essay, I'm talking about, like, I don't know, what the do Ottoman to, Empire. Yeah. Oh, um, I love the, Ottoman, the decline of the Ottoman oh, Empire. Are you kidding man. me? I'm there. I'm not here. I'm there. <laughs> Why do you need to quote, like... 14 different historians being like, yes, the Ottoman Empire declined, when you could also just look at what happened and be like, yeah, no, that didn't go so hot for them. Well, I guess because it's, it's, you're looking at the, how they came to their opinion. So we come to our opinion that the Ottoman Empire declined because we read 14 historians who told us that it declined. But why did they conclude that it declined? Because they read other historians. Because they, they read other decline. historians who were, or did they? And uh, did people at the time say it declined? But they might have also seen like. But that's the thing is, yeah, you know, maybe they they observed it themselves. And I'm not saying you don't need to quote any, but like, 
I feel like the concept that I cannot draw a conclusion in one of my own works without being like, it's okay, Von Ronke backed me. Like, that mm. I, That to me seems a bit pointless and silly. Because so then you're literally just like... evidence. No, but what if, what if I look at something? What if I look at the Ottoman Empire? I look at the stats for, like, their economy. Um, I look at how many of their people in charge got murdered. And I'm like, yeah, this is not going so hot. They're all getting killed. The economy's on a downturn. I personally, me, <laughs> Sarah Sarah Fay, I think the Ottoman Empire declined. I can't say that in a scholastic work and expect a decent mark if I don't say, but it's okay because Herbert Butterfield backed me up on this. Oh, well, you, can, you can. Don't get me started. You can. I mean, that... The point of the essay is is that it's your because as a historian you need a degree of imagination. Yeah, exactly. To, to and I feel able, like to be able to demonstrate what exactly why. my point is and what my tutor was saying last night is that he feels like a lot of where the field of history is going scholastically is that you aren't allowed that degree of creativity because you have to cite X amount of historians in an essay in order to, for it to be considered relevant. Well, I don't think the, the field isn't at a point where if you wanted to say something new and different you can do that. Hence why revi- revisionist historians make such a you know, make such a splash is because they're saying something new and different. Like with the case of the Ottoman Empires, for example, like you could assess the economic condition that it was in. You could analyze treaties and look at territory loss and stuff like that, or internal revolts, for example. But so you can make your own conclusion of that. Um, but fundamentally, what makes and this is the reality, is what fundam- fundamentally makes a good history essay is your ability to engage in the arguments put forward by other historians. And I think in a lot of ways that's going to depend on who's grading it because I think my tutor last night would definitely say, no, I want your own opinion, I want your own creativity because he mentioned that. Um, whereas I feel like I had another tutor second semester for this class, actually, who literally your essay was invalid if you did not quote a historian to back it up. Yeah, I can agree with that. I mean, all, like a bunch of my papers. In fact, I'll I'll be full disclosure. When I was a, when I was a fresher, <laughs> my them. first history paper, which I did a lot of research for and thought was really good, and I actually learned the most from that history paper of any paper I've written here. Um, I failed. I straight up got a six, and it was like a whole thing, yeah, and it was really embarrassing. Sure. And then my next paper, which I did, like. I think probably the same amount of research on, and I didn't really do anything much differently. I got a 16. So I think in the eye of the beholder is really important, especially for history papers, because it all depends a little bit who's reading it and what else is going on. And what they're looking for. Like, Yeah, I, exactly. I think it was very, not niche, but like interesting of my professor or my tutor last semester to literally just care about name dropping. And my interestingly enough, my professor... This year for history, um, I'm taking a history of political thought from Mockingjay to Talkville. Mm-hmm. We were discussing our last essay, which we just had to write. It was a 2,500 paper on Locke and Hobbes. Um, and this other girl and I in the class, Zoe, were like, how many sources do we need? Um, like, you know, because some professors have like a set amount and some, some don't. Some are like, just however many until you feel like you've learned it. Um, but we asked our professor, and he was straight up like, I don't know, five? And we were like, what? For a 2,500 paper? We've had it like drilled into us to like 16. And he was like... Maybe six. (laughs) I mean... But it's because... And he defended that. He was basically like, I want you guys to look so in-depth at these sources that you really know the sources instead of just name-dropping. Well, yeah, that's that's the key. I mean, Mm. I typically, for a 2,000-word paper, don't use more than eight sources. But I feel like a lot of what, you know, quoting historians and stuff is, is name-dropping. No, I think think it's more about... It's not so much name-dropping. It's the ability to engage in their arguments. And uh, what the... It's be able to condense and understand the viewpoint that they're putting through and then comparing it to someone who disagrees with it and then using your interpretation to decide where the line falls. And it's that engagement that they're looking for, I think. And it's, I don't think, I, I don't know if it's quite just name dropping. Obviously, they want people who are like generally on the course to be engaged. Like there was this video, for example, that came out. It was called, like, it was called Decolonizing SOAS. It was the School of Oriental and African Studies Divisive in London. sounding. Yeah, it was very divisive. But, <laughs> but they made an interesting point about um, when I quote people in the exam who I have read but who aren't on the reading list, I'm marked down. Because in their eyes, I haven't read. What's on the reading list? Read yeah, it. I've read the specific historians I should be mentioning in this. Yeah, so it's not... Which is kind of my point. I guess it's kind of bonkers in that way. Yeah. It's not promoting wider reading. It's more... About it's promoting you need to name drop these specific people in this essay, or 
it's invalid. Else. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, we, we don't believe you. Like, but you're lying. You can't understand why, though, because if you get an essay back and, you're, and it gets a poor grade and you look through it and you see it's like, you missed this really key bit of analysis by this key historian. So, oh. But maybe you found another bit of it. Maybe you drew your own conclusion. This is the problem, though, is that ultimately the reading lists, they're there for a reason. And the, the, yeah. These are, I mean, the people who we're studying are, are world experts. And if these think that these people are worth reading, then they probably have some basis for it. But I think to slide into our next question from that, that actually was a good segue. Mm. Um, how much can we trust historians? Harrison mentioned earlier... Not at all! <laughs> <laughs> Harrison mentioned earlier that they're hacks and snaky. So, you know, why... How do you know if you can trust a historian? Maybe maybe they're writing it for a purpose. Maybe they're writing it to promote something. Um, they're weaving a particular narrative because history is all about narratives. And so in that case, yeah, sure, you're quoting this world-famous historian, but, like, why was he writing that? Was it to change people's Well, it's about what's in fashion, isn't it? Yeah, no, exactly. no one was No one was writing about 12th century Islamic politics 20 years ago. And then all of then nine eleven nine eleven happened, and all of a sudden now Everyone anyone ever's reading about it is yeah. looking about it's looking at caliphates, it's looking at the ideas of jihad and Ghazi, it's looking about the interactions between Sunnis and Shias over periods of time. So it is it is very much about what's in fashion at the moment. Hundred year anniversary of World War One is coming up very soon, actually two weeks I think. And you know when twenty fourteen hit, all the books came out. It's the same with. Uh, it's so the same with the great anniversaries of anything. When Agincourt happens, there was a big fuss about that that came up 600 years in 2015. It's, uh, it's part of the trend. Um, but I guess it's more... Is it more of a question of why do they engage in narratives? Are, are you, what, no, you, my point is... What do you mean is, by narrative? If they're engaging in some sort of narrative, and I think that can... I Again, we can speak from so my what, experience. What would be, like, be an example for, of a narrative? Um... God, there are so many of all the historians that we learned last semester. Uh, Marxism, possibly? Yeah, like, they're... Exactly, Marxist history, they're Ugh. writing for a purpose. They're God. writing to expose class structures, blah, blah, blah. But they have, like, a goal in mind, which means that they're definitely going to be filtering out parts of history. They're so anachronistic, it's crazy. <laughs> I mean, oh, my God. <laughs> like, they're going to filter out stuff that doesn't fit their vision, but I still have to quote people. Um, I would do want to give a brief shout out to my favorite uh, Gertrude Himmelfarb, oh. <laughs> an anti-Marxist historian. Um, but great name, really. No, <laughs> really someone, fun. someone did her with that one. Yeah. <laughs> Gertrude Himmelfarb. God, I'm not, we're not here to judge on this program. No. Well, just, except for the so, historians here, to judge them. So, we hate them. So, <laughs> so you're saying that because. Some historians have an agenda. No, but a lot of historians have an agenda. A lot of and a lot of historians do, do you know have that? a point of view to see it through. Like, we've discussed in past episodes that I was taught French history growing up. Yes. That's taught by French historians who literally wrote the history to be like, yeah, France is awesome. Like, that, <laughs> and, you know, they think they're being impartial, but they've also been raised with nationalism, and they have a sense of nationalism, which means that their own critiques of their country aren't really going to be as much as, like, you know, an English person because the English hate the French, like that kind of thing. And so I think you run into that a lot with historians where, yeah, you're meant to be quoting them, you're meant to be saying, well, you know, Gertrude said this, but, you know, what did Gertrude have going on behind the scenes? Like, why do we trust so Gertrude? You're saying, what you're saying essentially then is no historian is capable of independent thought and that they must therefore, like, if they have an opinion, it's because it's been prescribed to them by a school that they have chosen to because it fits their no, own. No, I'm saying no one is impartial. Yeah, I think that's, Ooh, I th that's a different question. I think yeah. that's actually a good I thing because I was – so my best friend is from Raleigh, North Carolina, and so obviously then when the Civil War comes up, which it doesn't a lot, but when it does, when we talk about it, it's so clear. Like we were having a conversation with the Emancipation Proclamation and his opinion of it and what he was taught in the South is so different from what we're taught in the North. Could you give an example? Like so, what's the main oh, difference? Oh, I can too. He either. said – so he was like, OK. So the Emancipation Proclamation was like a total like PR stunt by Lincoln <laughs> to get the slaves to fight with him. <laughs> and I was like, well, no, that's not true because that came after the Battle of Gettysburg, which is basically when the North was going to win anyway. Like they already knew they were going to win because the South could not mount another offensive like they just had and he's like well no that's not true and then he went this went back and forth for a while and then eventually we we're just like you know what we were just really just taught two sides of a different coin i mean 
that's not that's not the saying. <laughs> yeah. But you know yeah, what I'm getting fall, at. I think, so yeah, but there's definitely bias in every, and it's a lot of it has to do with I guess national. I wouldn't. I don't know if I'd call the South a nationalistic tendency, but it's close to that. It's yeah, it's cultural, isn't it? Yeah. Well, well I think to touch on exactly that story, um, I grew up in California. Um, my mom grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and every year we would go back to Tennessee. And my mom would bring us, when we were quite little, um, to Civil War battlefields. And when we were little, we were like, this is a little niche, Mom. Like, why are we, why are you visiting these? Well, how old were you? I was a young, like, a seven wee, to, like, 11, a wee probably. <laughs> a wee sass. A wee There are, like, pictures of me in cargo pants that were way too big. Um, the dream. You should all look those up. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> moving on. So uh, she would take us to these battlefield sites. And we thought it was a little bit weird because we weren't really being taught American history. Um, but she said her big fear was that growing up in California, we would only ever hear the historical narrative that the South was full of bad people. And she wanted to take us to these battlefields be like, they died for something they believed in too. Um, which is interesting, but that's fine. <laughs> so she would bring us these battlefields Ugh. to basically be like, she was attempting to counteract a narrative that she thought we were going to be taught. And if we had American history, no doubt that's what we would have been taught based on Harris's story. Yes. And so th- I think that's just a good example of the fact that, like, the historian, like, they filtered out historians. You know, they pick historians that they agree with to support a case. I'm not saying that it is impossible. I'm not saying that it is possible that you can be completely partial. I think but it's, I just find it really interesting that something that is ingrained to us as historians is impartiality, impartiality, impartiality. But they're not. They're never impartial. That's what we learned in HI 2001. How come then then we have this entire narrative of historians must be impartial, they must have a basis of the facts. But we don't because we're taught taught from a a young age that history is written by the winners. That's like a that's like a historical phrase. We are, but as students, how come we are taught this to be impartial? Because no one no one wants to say that they're like that they're taking this stance that they're biased. No one can really admit that to themselves. I mean, especially they're like, no, I'm I'm the guy. I'm the one who's doing it. This is the right <laughs> thing. But in, the Whigs would definitely be every, like impartiality. I'm killing that. Every yeah. single ancient historian ever oh, always real. starts there. <laughs> Thucydides. While some have already analyzed, they have not been <laughs> as impartial as I. We shall be the most impartial. Wow, so how, what I'm curious about is, despite every single bit of training historians have to be impartial, we're now using this general term that every single one of them is just trying to further some political agenda through selling yeah. books. Yeah, we're all going to subscribe to something at the end of the day. It just depends on the way, like where it depends on our region or anything else like that, our upbringing, or what our parents think for a lot sure. of it. It's just we're all going to subscribe to something at the end of the day that we think is the correct notion of what actually happened. And even and then there are always going to be people who disagree with that. And that's kind of just it because they're subscribed to someone else and I'm subscribed to someone else. I mean they'll never be a truly impartial thing because history is full of hacks. <laughs> so when we write essays, That's the title of today's episode. Yeah. <laughs> when, when we write our history essays then. When we create arguments, are we furthering genders? Agendas? Sorry, not yeah. genders. That's Obviously, you have to have an argument. Or, or, you have are, to have or are you just a taking theme arguments? That you back. I just had to write an essay on Hobbes and Locke, and I had to. I chose, based on my research, to argue that they were not that similar. That, but a lot of historians. So did you do that based because my, that was your assessment of the facts? That was my assessment of the facts. You, you, but a lot of historians would argue that they are similar. So I but think it, it's it's so, also just like an interpretation so therefore, thing. So what we're saying then is that you – so when you did your assessment, mm-hmm. did you think you were just doing it on the basis of the evidence? Yes. So those, But I'm those sure who, they all do, so those except who came maybe not some. Because what it sounds like then is therefore is that those who have different opinions to us, because we believe that we're being impartial, yeah. those who have different opinions are furthering an agenda. They have no... no but I, but my, point, my point bringing that up was I was also furthering an agenda. My agenda was Hobbes and Locke are not the same. But you were doing that based on a critical assessment of the evidence. And was that not surely the rationale behind the people on the other side of the debate? Maybe they also think that. Because it's, it seems like it could be... It seems like it's furthering. I'm gonna a bring the Whigs attitude. back up. I think the Whigs were most definitely furthering an agenda. Well, it sounds like an almost partisan approach of, um, if you don't agree with me, you have an agenda. And you don't okay, care fine. About okay, facts. fine. Different example. Different example. I'd rather that sound the French Revolution. Yes. All right. Bang. We yes. definitely got. You definitely got some agendas there. More like of a slice some people the are. Butt. Twelve out of ten. 
having an agenda. Like, the British are going to look at that, they're like, okay, whatever, France. Like, no one cares, cute. Really. Yeah, exactly. Whereas France is like, this was the be all, end all event of the entire human history. I'm actually arguing the American that. Revolution was, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> France, they're like, what? That happened? Oh, only because we showed up and saved the day. Um, but, anyways, the, my point there is like, I, I don't even know if you can call that an agenda, but like, they definitely have a narrative that they're furthering. Yeah, it's like when I. This is true. Um, do I feel like we have to move on? I think, yeah. I think we have to move into our song, but our song actually vaguely relates to what we are talking on, on about. what has been by far and away the most fascinating discussion we've had so far. Actually. This has been some top-notch chat. Like, um, we've really gone at it. So I think uh, it's... Sarah, will we... Uh, you'll talk about the song after we play I will it. discuss the song after, but for right now, I hope you enjoy it. And we are back. I hope you guys enjoyed that song. So now the boys would like me to justify that because they did not understand my song choice. But if you have recently seen A Star Is Born then you will understand my song choice. Uh, so basically, if anyone hasn't heard of it, A Star Is Born uh, just came out in movie theaters. It just came out. It's been out for a little while, not too long, though. Um, and it stars Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga, and it is directed by Bradley Cooper. Um, but it is the third remake of that film, which I think is very interesting. The first one was in the 1940s. Um, the second one was in the 1980s with Barbara Streisand, if we've, if we've heard of her. Um, and then this one was Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper. So I chose... That song specifically because it's called Always Remember Us This Way, which I think is funny because, like, historically, what we were just discussing is historians trying to weave a narrative. That's a narrative. She's remembering in that particular way, and she doesn't want anything else to change. Fascinating. But anyway, so... That was the worst single link I ever Shut up. Ever shut up. Heard. I like the song. I also enjoy <laughs> the song. Anyways, <laughs> the point is, um, I been, think... You've been sacked. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know what? No one else is doing it. I had to get involved. And the, back to the point. Back to the point. Um, what I think should be discussed for at least 0 0.2 seconds, uh, because it is history related, and I think it could be talked about uh, within some narratives, is all these movie remakes that they are doing from movies that were popular in like the 80s or the 60s so or whatever. Like films that are being remade again and again and again. Yeah, they're just like redoing them. Like, I mean, High School Musical, they're making a TV show about it now for Netflix. Oh, they're doing a lot of TV reboots as well. Yeah. It's just like a bunch of, they're trying to bring back popular shows from whatever. But so, this one in particular, which I thought was very interesting, is that it was made initially in the 1940s. And I won't I won't give away the plot, um, but it's... Spoilers. It's, <laughs> spoilers. You can see this all in the trailer. Uh, but basically, Bradley Cooper's like a very famous star. He meets Lady Gaga... Um, he decides she's a great singer. They fall in love. He brings her on tour with him. Um, but throughout this entire film, he's dealing with very intense alcoholism. Uh, so he's, he's a very bad alcoholic, um, also a drug addict, all this stuff. Um, but the thing is, the film was written in the 40s. And oh. it's literally just been redone, 40s, 80s, 20, 2020. So like every 40 years, basically, it's been redone. It's for the 18, Sarah. Whatever, you know what I mean? It's basically the same thing, sure as. I'm sure by year, I'm sure it was not made in exactly 1980. The point is, the point is, um, it's going to be made, but it's like the themes in it are pretty much staying the same and they're just rendering it more modern. I guess that's the thing about Friends, isn't it? That people get, people now who are watching Friends for the first time in this day and age find it a bit, uh, some of the themes involved in it are, they think are, aren't appropriate or a bit. Um, on so, PC, yeah, that kind of thing, yeah. yeah. And I guess, uh, do we need to meet, remake Friends or like how themes evolve over time? But it's it's that, it's that they're not changing it; they're just like changing the actors. But they they are rendering it vaguely more modern because, like, you know, they have cell phones <laughs> to like message one another. But I don't actually, you know, I don't know if they ever pull out a cell phone in the in the film. Um, but I think it also normalizes stuff in a different time period, like. The way that she treats him, because um, he is a very bad alcoholic, is she kind of, like, takes care of him a lot. Um, and it's viewed as, like, vaguely normal. Or, like, he randomly shows up at her house, which I think is vaguely creepy. Um, and, like, just to, like, watch her sleep in something. And I think in the 1940s, you're like, wow, that's romance. And maybe some people today think that's romance. But some people today, I think, like I did, would also be like, that's a little creepy. <laughs> like, why is One, he just showing up? Why does he just text her, like, you up or something? I don't know. One excellent example of this is the remake of the Ghostbusters. Oh, my God, true. That's, that's a very divisive one because... 
that that one's ridiculously divisive though. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's just like a bunch of dudes sitting around in the basement getting all mad. They're like women, and it doesn't make any sense. It's like the Star Wars thing, like when they showed the trailer for The Force Awakens, and they had um I don't know the actor's name, but. He's the he's the African-American guy who plays the stormtrooper for a second and he came up on screen. That was a huge issue. Like a lot of pe- a lot of like nerds were like, "No, there can't be a black. They're clones." And it was this whole thing. That's ridiculous. Like, oh god, I'm upset. <laughs> we, found, we found Harrison's trigger point. Um, we did. Harrison. Actually, that might actually be devices as well. Racist. <laughs> Um, just should, to, we, should we move on back to the more... Well, I'm just going to make a quick summary yeah. of for anyone that's just now joined us. You know who you are. Um, on what we've been talking about. We started off talking about... It's, it's been a bit of a segue episode. Um, but we started off talking about whether or not history needs historians. Then we moved on to do we need historians in our essays. Then we moved on to are historians just hacks? And now we've moved on to the remakes of movies and to rewriting those based on the time period, which is... Slightly related to history because that's what historians did and what we discussed earlier. Um, that they rewrite it based on what's in vogue or popular at the time. But now, in honor of our guest star, we're now going to yes. go around the room and talk about our favorite historical hacks. Fave, fave historian hacks. Who would like to start? <laughs> uh, sure, why don't you start? I think Harrison should conclude because he's going to go off. I'm he's going to go off, I'm and I'm excited. I'm still mad. I've, got, I've got two. Um, it's difficult. It's difficult. 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 I think, I think probably the big one is David Irving. Um, now, for those who don't know about David Irving, David Irving was a very, very prominent historian on Nazi Germany, um, and essentially what he did uh, during his time was that he assessed the source material and argued that Adolf Hitler, uh, leader of the Nazi Party, was completely unbeknownst that the Holocaust was taking place, and that if uh, he had known about it, he would have stopped it immediately. Um, he therefore, he also went on to argue that the, the camps that have been found at Auschwitz and in Treblinka and places like that are completely fabricated and the events that are apparently, in her, his eyes supposedly took place there, uh, didn't happen at all. So what this led to happen is uh, this historian called, I think it's Deborah Lipstadt, maybe, uh, in her book, Denying the Holocaust, accused him of, uh, manipulating information, of uh, portraying things in a way. And he saw this as defamation and libel and sued her and Penguin Books. This got made into a film recently called Denial, I think it's called. Oh, shit. I'm, oh, and, man. I should watch that. And, um, Speaking of movies, yes. Yeah, and <laughs> eventually, uh, his claim that her calling his evidence misrepresentative as libel was thrown out because a court had to decide that his uh, argument was based in zero fact. Uh, Richard Evans was called to the stand, uh, who did w- What is History? So eventually, uh, it was denounced that he had fabricated evidence um, to pursue an ideological and political agenda of anti-Semitism, racism, and also of portraying Adolf Hitler in a favorable light. So of all the historical hacks, he's probably, he's probably up there with, um, probably certainly the most infamous, particularly in Great Britain. He well, really is up there. He's certainly up there for people I dislike. Um, yeah. He's not, not, a, not a big character. fan of Holocaust deniers, personally. That's a bit of a sore point. Um, yeah, dislike them. Okay. Well, he'll catch hands at a later date. Um, so on to mine. Mine is a bit, I guess, it's just more annoying, not, like, divisive. Mine's just kind of irritating. Yeah, mine's quite divisive. Yours is quite I'll, divisive. I'll, I'll um, mine's just, like, irritating. I think we all know Leopold von Ronke. Ranke. I still don't know how to say his name. God. Um, So for those of you that don't, we studied him last semester in HI 2001. And he's basically this dude that was like, I'm going to be a historian. And then worked for the Prussian government. And then the Prussian government fell apart. And he like... Kind of, kind of also fell apart. He was like, I don't know what to do now. I was so in favor of that. Um, And so he just like locked himself in his house to write like a history of the world and he was just sort of like prussia no longer a thing that's canceled i still see it from my lot like house that i've locked myself in so as not to have to like face reality while i write a history of the middle ages it's way 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 too long he didn't finish it, did he no he didn't finish he died which is it's karma really because that was so irritating harsh. and <laughs> he just he was just kind of an irritating guy and he had some he had some silly opinions no i, um, I love leopold von 
wrong because he comes up with the school of historiography, which I love. But then he then <laughs> as soon as he does that, becomes the royal historiographer. So he made up his own job title, which is hilarious <laughs> because. So like the they didn't need one up until then, but he made it seem like they he was did. like guys, it's legit. I swear. <laughs> yeah. So he, he, that was that's pretty badass. <laughs> no, no, that irritates me. Uh, I don't like uh, that. Yeah, his idea of historismus. Oh man. Oh, my God. Uh, oh it took me uh, took me a while to figure that one out. I still don't actually. I still don't know what it means. Yeah. Um, that, that's a look up. That's a uh, we can't explain. Sarah's that. <laughs> frantically googling now. I don't know. Yeah. I'm I'm answering snakes. He's listening. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> well, Harrison. Where to begin? Oh, is it my turn? Yeah, it's your turn. Oh, saying. cool. Okay, so I'm talking about a dude <laughs> named Thomas Babington Macaulay. Oh, my oh, God. No, my I remember him. Babington Macaulay. Oh. So Thomas Babington Macaulay is the father of what's known as Whiggish history. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so this dude writes a book called The History of England where he celebrates the whitest dudes you can imagine for the whole book. Any guy that has any semblance of an idea that's slightly close to his ideas of like morality or how government should be run and he that's like a it's basically just like uh it's like a love letter to himself and to make him feel better about his own governmental things and to justify why england is the way it is so it was so Bad and so clearly biased and terrible <laughs> that there's literally another school of history called anti Whig history <laughs> to fight his school of history. This is this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> no one knows what they're talking about because the, uh, I, who's right? The Whigs, the anti Whigs, they both got opinions. Who's to say at this point? It's like uh. you give a clear and balanced argument. Oh yeah, wow! If you combine them both, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I Combine them both, divide by two. Of all the narratives that we've talked about, wigs are pretty. God, the wigs were In so terms divisive. Of just like, just so completely unbeknownst of themselves. Oh, man, they were like, we got this. We're nailing this impartiality. But like, like yeah, yeah, they, really, they're just the in words. their minds, they're like, okay, so we're the best society in the world, obviously, right, guys? And they're like, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and then they're like, okay, so how did we get here? And we're like, oh, because everyone else was awesome back then, too, and they all agreed with us <laughs> the whole time. And that's why we're all like this. That's not true. That's a lie. You're lying to yourself and everyone else. And that's my issue, everybody. That Actually, was... What? I'm gonna I'm gonna add to that. Do you, do you guys know who Alexis de Tocqueville is? I know, I know of him. He's not he's not a Whig historian. He, um, he's French, but he, yeah. he is French. He kind of did the same thing. Basically, um, he's a he's a political political historian. Um, and like yeah, that's what he yeah, is. Yeah, he analyzed political systems in New York. Yeah, yeah. Well, he <laughs> this is my favorite because I had to study this for a book review book recently in history, and basically. The guy was writing about colonialism and his opinions on colonialism. And he was like, well, we're definitely doing some messed up stuff. Like, this is not going well. We're like, we're, we're not doing nice things to the Algerians. But the French economy needs this <laughs> because that'll make it stronger. And we need nationalism to stay together as a country. And so we can have nationalism if we all just, like murder the Algerians. Mm. And that's literally his argument. So he's like, oh, I know, it's so divisive. (laughs) And so so he literally was like, so in that line of thinking, colonialism is great because France is great and France needs to stay great. Yeah, this is actually good because... Thomas Babson in this book, <laughs> my favorite part of it. So he, he's in the middle of talking about the English Wait, Civil so who War. Who is this story? Thomas Babington. This is oh, Babington okay. Macaulay. Sorry, back at him. He, um, in his book, he's talking about the English Civil Wars, and so this around that time, the Puritans, like the Pilgrims as we know them in America, they come to America and they set up their thing. He goes off on a tangent. He's not even talking. He goes off on like how great they are and how they killed all the Indians and how they made America so freaking cool. And then he's like, and that was because of their Whig ideals that I have as well. That's why, and this is writing in the 1890s, America becomes the biggest economy in the world. He's like, and that's why they're doing so well, because of us. That's ridiculous, dog. That's so <laughs> crazy. <laughs> oh, I hate him. <laughs> yeah, he's, the Whigs are truly up there. They're like the definition of a DPC. The, like, similar to the Whigs in terms of their sort of blasé approach to facts, uh, Marxism. <laughs> Oh man! Um, there's a new film actually coming out called The Young Karl Marx. Um, I had a look at the trailer and oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> sure is not amused. I'm not impressed. Although interestingly, I was talking to my Russian history uh, tutor um, about uh, 
about the death of Stalin. Oh, I love that movie. It's, it's a good. brilliant film. I yeah. really enjoy it. Honestly, I think it'd be better as a play than a film. Yes. But I was talking to her about it. I was like, oh, would you, did you, have you not seen it? This is about the most exciting bit of pop culture about Stalin that's come out in a while. And she's like, oh, I took a look at the trailer and it was too much for me. Couldn't handle the British humor. Oof. <laughs> it is very British. It but is. It, it, yeah. it's, it's, it's top. It's top. It's really enjoyable. I would highly recommend it um, to anyone who has any interest in the period or... Even just, you know, it's just a good yeah, comedy yeah. as well. Yeah, it's, it a, it's awesome comedy. And, and it's you learn funny. something. Okay, well, not really, but... Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Like, you learn that Khrushchev way. takes over. I didn't know that. No, I knew that. I'm yeah, you learn a bit about... <laughs> yeah, you, it's a, fa- a fascinating look at the di- dynamics of it all. Um, I think we're going we're gonna to pause for about... We have about two minutes to spare for this, unfortunately. Um, but we want to answer one of the points in our comments, uh, one of the questions in the comments from one of our listeners, which uh, Snakey says, I see the issues you mentioned, guys, but what's the problem with taking different approaches? Would you be ready to see whether or not intolerance toward different approaches, different interpretations may not lock you up in specific her new medical, I definitely mispronounced that, approach itself, very specific and West-centered, which obviously seems true and evident, and evident to us, but which might actually miss certain crucial points or deform slightly, but systemically, the objectivity of facts and events. Give us your take on that, Sarah. Dissect that for... So basically, um, what I think we are arguing um, is that... Oh, thank you for defining that. Um, <laughs> what we need to call is about interpretation. <laughs> Um, Ouch. So, <laughs> and we didn't know what that was. Thank you. That's a, that's a True dirty, story. I don't know what that was. It's a dirty um, IR word. It is. So I think our point about why we dislike historians that have so such specific opinions is that they're ignoring a lot of other narratives. And so I think the argument could possibly be made that you can study a bunch of different historians and like combine their narratives. But in and of itself, the study of Von Ranke or Augustine or... Babington, um, ah. any of those guys, they're very specific in what they talk about. And they're not objective. Um, and, you know, they are West-centered because they're all Western historians. Um, and so I think it's not that we're not tolerant toward different approaches. It's it, I think it's quite the opposite, that we are intolerant of one specific approach where they ignore everything else. Yeah, it's like a teleological approach. It's just yeah, where they're because, trying to... Oh, my God, because, teleological. Because, oh, yeah. no, not again. Because yeah. as much as we dislike the one-sided approach that Whiggish and Marxist historians give, we can't study certain periods without their work. It is, you know, they provide valuable research. They provide valuable insights and give an excellent point for, of discussion. And they, I think they teach you about their time period too, like what yeah, people the then which thought valid. Written, which, God, um, that's another podcast topic right there. Yeah, um, but we'll bring that up another time. Don't thought, worry. That, that's a fascinating point, really. Is. That is. I think it's more Sarah backtracking on her. There's just a lot to be said here, guys. Yeah. Um, but I think the point is, is that if you, you can't study just one historian if they are too niche. Like, if you're going to study Babington, you got to study the anti wigs Like, you have to have a broad spectrum of different historians, different minds, different backgrounds. I mean, we haven't even brought up the Annals School yet. That's so. accurate. Uh, um, I forgot some of our history them. classes do take take perspectives on the third world. Yeah, the, third, um, the third world perspective of history, we haven't really talked about in this show. No, um, we should. We should do, we'll do we a podcast probably, on that. We'll do a podcast on um, the influence of non-Western uh, schools of thought and their inclusion. Yeah. Um, because certainly it's a topic that I don't think... It's becoming more popular now to talk about. Well, not popular to talk about, but it's an issue that's been raised that I think needs a lot of addressing. Um, and I think that certainly warrants a podcast on... So we will, we will spend a podcast on that. Um, but I thank think you. to end our show, we do a, we're doing like our a final th- segment. For a second. Freak of the week. Freak of the week. Um, I must admit, I'm, I'm pretty strapped this week in terms oh, of I've what I have. One. Um, so I'm going to go with Voltaire, going along the sort of um, the political historian view, as we talked about. With yeah, Hill, we did. And, Locke and, Hobbes. Uh, and he wrote a book called uh, Candide, which is... He um, did. We've read it. I've is, read it. I haven't read it. If I'm you haven't read it... It's, it's a little weird. If you haven't read it, it's essentially a historical... Well, it's a satirical take on this idea of sort of um, all everything happens for the best, doesn't it? Yeah. And uh, I think that's generally the sentiment that comes out throughout the it's book. A bit weird. So this character goes through this absurd sort of um, 
journey of sort of surviving earthquakes and syphilis and see some weird stuff <laughs> traveling the new world and being disemboweled and things like that Yikes. um and it's just uh, it's a very bizarre book um him and also jonathan swift his poem uh, his essay a modest proposal which ticks the mick out of enlightenment ideals by suggesting that we eat irish children because there's overpopulation there and people are starving <laughs> So I think they're probably um, probably people who weren't so much freaks now, and we probably take a lot of validity in their ideas, but certainly at the time they were most definitely freaks of their eras and really kind of pushing the boat out there of what was acceptable in historical thought. So I guess that's probably mine. Um, I will, any, anyone want to jump in with theirs? I will go. I, want, I think Harrison's our guest star, so he should finish. Um, I, mine is only vaguely freaky. Uh, Pope Gregory the Ninth, when he was in power in the Middle Ages, he <laughs> declared that cats were to be associated with the devil's worship, because I don't know, that was his mood at the time. Um, and he had them exterminated in droves. And that's a little freaky, because, like, what, what's your issue with cats, dude? But my favorite part of that story is that that led to the plague, because when all the rats came... There were no cats to eat them, so he Bit inadvertently. Jump, but, you know. <laughs> okay, but like, but like, you see where I'm coming from. Inadvertently, this man could have prevented the plague. It could have minimized the plague, but he didn't because he got rid of cats because he decided that they were associated with devil's worship. Why? Who's to say? Bit of an odd dude. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's quite a jump to say that if there were more cats, we would no, but like, black I like cats. not necessarily. <laughs> no, but it's not necessarily that much of a jump because there was nothing to to sort of rein in the amount of rats that were running around. So they were literally just like multiplying. Which first off, you know me, you know that I hate rats. And you hate multiplying. I guess it's that too. <laughs> God, math. Uh, but they were just like running around in droves, and maybe some of them could have been eliminated. With cats, but maybe the cats would have brought the plague then. <laughs> well, cats cats aren't well, carriers. That'd been a quick turn of the knife. <laughs> <laughs> cats are not carriers. That sort of thing. I don't think. Yeah. Who's Because they're not snaky, unlike rats. Ugh. Mm. Um. All right. Do you want to? Do you want me to do mine? I'll do mine. Yeah. Go okay. For so I was gonna do uh, General George Custer, who's a very famous American uh, general. Very famous. Who he is. Famously died at the Battle of Little Bighorn. Oh. Why he died at, Little B- died at the Battle of Little Bighorn, also known as Custer's Last Stand, is hilarious. So <laughs> we love dude, a bit of so death here, High Guys history. Of, uh, Black Hills of Dakotas, very sacred lands for the Sioux Indians. They're like, hey, I think there's gold there, so they move in. They, the white settlers move in. Not gonna happen. This gets the biggest collection of Plains Indians ever amassed, and so he brings like 500 guys. He's Custer brings like 500 guys to fight like thousands of Native Americans. And he's like, I got this. I'm the best there's ever been. <laughs> so he gets up on this ridge. He sees this big Indian camp, and he's like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to charge at them right now. So he sends these guys to charge at them. So they're charging. They're about to hit him. And they're like, wait, everyone get off your horse. We're forming a line. <laughs> Mistake. Mistake number one. <laughs> and then, so one that many. failed immediately. And then he was like, okay, so I'm going to take the rest of my guys. I'm going to get off this ridge that I'm on right now. And then I'm going to go down and try to attack them from behind. No, the Indians got up on the ridge. And then <laughs> having the high ground easily beat Custer. He clearly because, never read The Art of War. Yeah. Yes. Or watched Revenge of the Sith. His name's Crazy Horse. He's <laughs> badass. And he's got a really cool statue next to Mount Rushmore. Anyway, General C- George Custer, a weenie. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, on that note, we're going to play our last song, which is, you'll recognize it's called Supercut by Lord, which is uh, probably what historians do when they're choosing which events they want to put in that fit their narrative. Honestly, Heck yeah. Terrible. terrible. I love about a device. You're this. But anyways. Anyway, I'm not here next week. Oh, yeah, I do no. apologize. I will not be here next week. I will be uh, in Cambridge doing Model UN, but we will have guest stars. Never fear. Yes, um, Harry will be back. Uh, Harry hey. will be back. And then we will have Chambers, um, if you know him. So that'll be fun. But in the meantime, we'd just like to say thank you to you all for listening. We will see you next week at the same time. And thank you to Harrison for guest starring oh. and talking about historical hacks. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's been brilliant, guys. Thanks so much. See you next week. In my head. I play a supercut of us All the magic we gave off